Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1162 of This Week in Amateur Radio. We have a lot of news from the International Amateur Radio Union this week, including stories on how the IARU represented amateur radio at a recent ITU meeting on the interference potential of wireless power transfer. The IARU continues preparations for the upcoming World Radio Communications Conference 2023, and the IARU has adopted a standard branding policy across all the regions of the world, while Region 2, the Americas, ponders the future of its conference meetings. Authorities in Germany clamped down on solar panel accessory manufacturers due to high RF interference. The next series of virtual ham fests are coming up. They include CPAC and the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. We will have all the details on both. The Radio Amateurs of Canada invite amateurs around the world to participate in the RAC Canada Day Contest. Repeaters and beacon stations in the Netherlands will be hit with a 79 euro charge in the near future. The FCC is paving the way and opening the door for a new series of LPFM license grants. The ISS will be welcoming its first European female commander. And a new communications tower just went online in Turkey. It is also now the tallest structure in Europe. We will have all the details and a lot more news coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about your domain privacy with generic data on a Who Is search and we'll talk about Amazon's upcoming activation of its new mesh network called Sidewalk. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will help to bring a sense of order into your connector chaos. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes a more in-depth look at the state of amateur radio in the early to mid-50s. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, this week begins a new four-part series on how to promote your radio club's upcoming meeting or perhaps a local ham fest on broadcast radio through the successful writing of a public service announcement and getting it on the air. All of that and a whole lot more is straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, taking to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in hot and hazy Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting this week from my humble home studio in Cortlandville, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our amateur radio station high atop the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the corn is up about three inches now, the peas are up about six inches, and in fact the rest of the garden is growing like a weed. In fact, the weeds are growing like weeds. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the cottonwoods are layering everything with fluffy white seedlings, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where rumor has it Mother Nature has set up a GoFundMe page to help with her humongous water bill this month, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off this week's news, the International Amateur Radio Union recently represented the amateur service at the International Telecommunications Union meetings on the interference potential of wireless power transfer to the bands. This meeting was held virtually, with some 350 delegates in attendance worldwide. Here with more on this story is Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting from the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service in the UK. 
For years, radio users have suffered with proposals for new technologies that don't want to use the radio spectrum for communication purposes, but see it as a convenient playground for the general transfer of energy from one place to another. I'm afraid VDSL falls into that slot for me, ramming high-speed data down DC copper cables and not giving a damn about the appalling radio frequency interference it produces as illegal radiation. And what about radio frequency furnaces or irradiation techniques that use RF to sterilize food? If the RF is not contained, it causes untold pollution to the radio spectrum. And we've only got one spectrum. Now we face wireless power transfer, converting power to radio frequencies to bridge a gap in place of cables. And we're not just talking about charging your electric toothbrush here, a tiny signal across a few millimetres. No, this is bulk transfer of big power, using the poor old radio spectrum pretty indiscriminately as a convenient bridge, and to hell with the other users. And would you believe that the people who peddle this technology are saying that the RF interference it will cause doesn't matter anymore because the spectrum's already badly polluted with man-made noise, so one more contributor doesn't matter. The International Amateur Radio Union recently represented the amateur service at a meeting held virtually with some 350 delegates registered about wireless power transmission, or WPT. Wireless power transmission is the transmission of electrical energy without wires as a physical link. A transmitter device, driven by electrical power from a power source, generates a time-varying electromagnetic field which transmits power across space to a receiver device which extracts the power from the field and supplies it to an electrical load. The technology of wireless power transmission can eliminate the use of wires and batteries, thus increasing the mobility, convenience and safety of an electronic device for all users. Wireless power transfer is useful to power electrical devices where interconnecting wires are inconvenient, hazardous or are just not possible. And wireless power techniques mainly fall into two categories, near field and far field. The problem with WPT is that it can also cause radio frequency interference. The working group has a number of documents under consideration, covering such matters as wireless power transmission using technologies other than radio frequency beam, the technical characteristics and impact analyses of non-beam inductive wireless power transmission for mobile and portable devices on radio communication services, Assessment of the impact of wireless power transmission for electric vehicle charging on radio telecommunication services. And guidance on frequency ranges for operation of wireless power transmission. Finally, the group is also looking at the conducting of impact studies and human hazard issues for wireless power transmission. The IARU input was mainly focused on proposing amendments to materials submitted by other delegations and suggesting a new annex which documents measurements of typical amateur radio signal levels compared to the test data from the USA on non-beam WPT emission levels and to suggest limits. Most of the discussions on the detail were resolved with a degree of compromise. Outstanding technical issues remaining include whether electrical field antennas are as susceptible to wireless power transmission emissions as magnetic field antennas, and what the true noise levels are in residential areas, with wireless power transmission developers claiming that emissions from their equipment will not be significantly above the now very elevated general noise level. In terms of measurement, IARU Member Society in Germany, the DARC, has made good progress with the rollout of its ENAMS automated noise measurement system, and the IARU is now able to draw heavily on that data. The wireless power transfer emissions document has now been under discussion for some time. There is no agreement yet on whether this should be a report or a recommendation, and the work has been carried forward to the next meeting in November 2021. Discussion on beam wireless power transfer covered a range of issues, including amendments to the proposed frequencies, none of which are below 800 MHz. But sadly, many of the proposed frequencies fall into spectrum which the amateur service shares with other services. However, given the nature of the technology and the directivity of amateur antennas in these frequency ranges, the prospect of coexistence seems quite good. Some concerns were expressed about the rate of progress on some reports and recommendations, with the point being made that the industry is bringing products to market already. 
This was followed by a proposal from the floor to continue drafting groups between now and the next meeting. There were objections to this proposal, and so the next discussions will be at the November 2021 meeting, at which the IARU will make a further substantial input. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Spectrum Affairs Chair Barry Lewis, G1SJH, reports that efforts continue in defending the interests of amateur radio during preparations by CEPT, the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administrations, for World Radio Communication Conference 2023. The International Telecommunication Union sponsors the World Radio Communication Conference. Meeting on May 21st, the IARU worked with CEPT regional telecommunications organizations at the third meeting of the conference preparatory group. The CPG is the parent group in CEPT that oversees the development of the CEPT briefs for each World Radio Communication Conference 2023 agenda item and reviews the progress of individual project teams under the conference preparatory group umbrella. International Amateur Radio Union Regions put forward the agreed preliminary IARU positions for agenda items that could affect amateur radio. IARU's overall objective is to safeguard the allocations to the amateur and amateur satellite services in the co and adjacent frequency bands with the scope of each agenda item. CEPT briefs include a specific section in which the views of all the recognized international and regional organizations can be placed, and IARU's views are now in this section of the draft briefs for each agenda item of interest. The meeting also heard presentations from other Region 1 RTOs as well as organizations from Region 2 and Region 3 about their preparations. These presentations and the CEPT meeting document drafts are available via the CEPT website. The IARU Spectrum and Regulatory Liaison Committee continues to be active in all the CEPT project teams dealing with the World Radio Communication Conference preparation. The International Amateur Radio Union Region 2 Executive Committee conducted its quarterly meeting on May 26 via Zoom. President Ramon Santoyo, XE1KK, moderated the session. Region 2 of the International An Amateur Radio Union covers the Americas. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report from League Headquarters on the recent meeting. The EC has formally adopted an IARU branding policy. This means that all three IARU regions and member societies will use the same gold IARU logo to create a common unified identification of all activities. Member societies are supposed to adopt the gold logo by year's end. Other discussion at the EC session focused on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on 2022 General Assembly meeting planning, the gist of it being that all future general meetings and workshops will need to be planned as either all virtual events or as hybrid events with attendees both in person and remote. The EC concluded that it's too early to make any decisions about 2022 given the uncertain future of travel and infection control around the world. The IARU Administrative Council will meet on June 8th. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. In other matters, Jay Bellows, K0QB, has resigned as Treasurer and Director of Area B, the ARRL. Rod Stafford, W6ROD, is the new ARRL International Affairs Vice President and will serve as Area B Director. Santoyo will assume the role of treasurer with Bellows' support until the next official elections at the 2022 General Assembly. Diego Salome, LU8ADX, has been appointed as the new IARU Region 2 Awards Manager, taking over the role previously handled by Ronaldo Leandro, WYV5AM, who recently became a silent key. The manufacturer of a solar panel optimizer has been restricted from doing business in the German market because of concerns over RF interference. The Southgate News Service is reporting that German regulator Bundesnetzagentur, Benetza, has said that it has taken the action against SolarEdge because some of the optimizers cause levels of RF interference that do not comply with directives set by the European Union. 
The company, which has offices around the world, describes itself as a leading manufacturer of photovoltaic converters for solar power systems. According to a translation from Veron, the largest amateur radio association in the Netherlands, Solar Edge's representative in Germany has four weeks to correct the problem before the regulator prohibits the product's national sale altogether. According to reports, the restriction applies only to Germany, despite the RF pollution directive setting an EU-wide standard. The company's website did not contain a statement responding to the German regulator's actions. Solar Edge's optimizer is not the only product by any manufacturer that the German regulators has noted as being out of compliance. Recent study results published by Binetza have shown that 75% of solar panel installations and 25% of LED lights studied failed to meet European Union standards. The chance to activate a castle or an island has always ignited the imaginations of many hands. But the activations taking place near Bannerman Castle on New York's Bannerman Island in New York State's Hudson Valley region on Saturday, June 12th, has less to do with imagination and more to do with a real-life goal. Radio operators who are part of the Hudson Valley Digital Network are hoping to make contact worldwide from locations along the Hudson River to bring attention to the need to restore Bannerman Island and its buildings for visitor safe use as a public park. Bannerman Island is not part of the Islands on Air Awards program. It belongs to the New York State Park System and is one of six islands in the Hudson River. Eight amateur radio stations will be on the air between 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern Time, one of them from the island itself using the call sign November 2 Bravo. The stations are activating under the sponsorship of the Hudson Valley Relay. Operators logging these stations will receive a commemorative certificate and information on how to contribute to fundraising campaign to help the nonprofit Bannerman Castle Trust restore the island. To be listening for November 2 Bravo along with stations operating nearby, November 2H, November 2U, November 2D, November 2S, November 2 Oscar, November 2N, and November 2 Victor. They will be using various modes, including CW, single sideband, and the digital modes. We thank the East Greenbush Amateur Radio Association for this story. Brazil's communications regulator, Anatel, recently requested a meeting with the National Amateur Radio Society, Labre, to discuss how to conduct the country's online exams. The meeting took place remotely on May the 19th, 2021. Anatel faces problems in meeting the great demand of people from all over Brazil who wish to become radio amateurs or progress in their licensed class. Anatel mentioned that it only has a few examiners, as well as technical limitations in the online test application platform Microsoft Teams, which prevents it from making further progress in meeting the demand. During the meeting, the Brazilian Amateur Radio Society commented that, in addition to the problems of the small number of places and locations made available for the tests, there's another problem even more serious, which is the current complexity and slowness in the various systems for licensing stations, which has caused a lot of stress and frustration for candidates, even to the point of causing some individuals to give up on obtaining their call signs or licensing their stations. Labre presented several observations on this process, which has been long, extremely complex and bureaucratic. The regulator Anatel proposed a joint effort to carry out tests, and Labre made itself available to assist in this initiative, including the provision of tests online or even in person if applicable. The suggestion will be presented to Labre's board of directors at their next meeting on the 10th of June for consideration. Labre also commented on the need to revise and modernize the current regulatory framework for amateur radio in Brazil and review the evidence provided by Labre so that it better fits the current reality of amateur radio. Anatel responded that the revision of the main standard that governs Brazilian amateur radio is being worked on and the revision of the evidence will be part of this work in the near future. New meetings will be held soon, and Labre will disseminate the results of the topics covered as soon as possible afterwards. If you want to read more, look at tinyurl.com forward slash IARU hyphen Brazil. The 2021 CPAC Virtual Convention is Saturday, June 5th. The event billed as the AWRL Northwestern Division Convention includes free live and pre-recorded video presentations and seminars. Advanced registration via Zoom is required. 
The program began at 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, or 1600 UTC, with keynote speaker AWRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA. Some webinar topics include reporting earthquakes using WinLink, trends in 6-meter Earth-Moon Earth communications, and information about AWRL Foundation scholarships that support young radio amateurs pursuing higher education. The ARRL Forum, which was open to all, was held at 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, led by Northwestern Division Director Mike Ritz, W7VO. Complete convention details, including the 2021 CPAC Virtual Booklet, are available on the CPAC website. The affiliated 2021 CPAC QSO Party will take place Saturday and Sunday, June 5th through the 6th. The objective is to encourage radio amateurs in the Pacific Northwest and beyond to work as many stations as possible in celebration of the annual CPAC ham radio conventions, past and future. CPAC is sponsored by the Oregon Tualatin Valley Amateur Radio Club and co-sponsored by the Clark County Amateur Radio Club. Following two years of canceled in-person events, Chairman John Buksek, KE7WNB, says the event is looking forward to its 40th anniversary convention next year, scheduled for June 3rd through the 5th, 2022, at the newly remodeled and expanded Seaside Oregon Convention Center. Also just ahead is the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, readying its third show since the online format debuted last year. Here with more details on the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, readying its third show since the online format debuted last year, takes place August 14th and 15th. Organizers have issued a casting call for radio amateurs who may have some particular knowledge, project, or technique to share with attendees. ARRL is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. If you didn't visit either of the two previous shows, check out this one. It's a really cool experience. Event organizers are expecting to have some 80 presentations on various topics. For this show, the QSO Today team is looking for presenters and speakers who will focus on a single topic, taking a TED Talk approach. Ten bucks gets you in the virtual door. Hit the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo website for more information. It's QSO Today Ham Expo. That's all one word. QSO Today Ham Expo.com. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. After the inaugural show in August 2020, the Expo sponsors announced that the show would become a twice-yearly event in March and August. The March 2021 edition attracted thousands of visitors, although it was plagued by some technical issues. Expo Chairman Eric Guth, VZ1UG slash WA6IGR, has assured that this August show of return to a single virtual presentation platform should make everything work smoothly. Guth says he already has more than 40 presentations lined up with a goal of more than 80. Presentations will be offered semi-live with the main content pre-recorded and Q&A sessions conducted live online using Zoom. QSO Today has offered resources for presenters and speakers on its website. Once again, early bird tickets to the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo are $10 and then $12.50 starting on August 13th. The AWRL Ham Fest and Convention page lists upcoming virtual and in-person ham fests, conventions, and flea markets, and it includes a search engine. Help Canada celebrate its birthday on the air during the Radio Amateurs of Canada Canada Day Contest on Thursday, July 1st, just a few days ahead of Independence Day in the U.S. Canada Day is the anniversary of Canada's Confederation, when the three colonies of Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick united into the Dominion of Canada on July 1, 1867. The RAC Contest Committee is asking all participants in the 2021 Canada Day Contest to follow guidelines provided by the government and by health officials in their respective areas for any multi-operator categories. The Canada Day Contest begins on July 1st 
at 0000 UTC, which is the evening of Wednesday, June 30th in North American time zones, and continues through 2359 UTC. Bands include 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, 6, and 2 meters, CW and SSB, FM, AM, and digital modes. Stations in Canada send signal reports plus province or territory. VE zeros and stations outside Canada send a signal report and a serial number. Stations may be worked once on each mode on each of the available bands. Canada's 10 provinces and three territories serve as multipliers for the event. The Federal Communications Commission is seeking comment on the impact of the continuing global shortage of semiconductors. The FCC's May 11th public notice stated its concern is focused on the impact of the shortage would have on the communications industry, agency initiatives, and the nation's continued advancement in the next generation technologies. FCC Acting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel commented, the communications sector is one of the fastest growing segments of the semiconductor industry. These tiny pieces of technology are the basic building blocks of modern communications including 5G, Wi-Fi, satellites, and more. And that is why we are seeking to better understand the current shortage, its consequences for communications sector, and steps we can take to ensure the FCC priorities and initiatives remain on track. Interested parties may file comments online using the FCC's electronic comment filing system. Initial comments are due on June 10th, and reply comments, which are comments on the previous filed comments, are due on June 25th. ARRL East Bay Section Manager Jim Siemens, W6LK, is stepping down because he is relocating to Wyoming. Siemens has served as East Bay Section Manager since July 2018. Mike Patterson, N6JGA, has been appointed to succeed him effective June 1st. Siemens said, There really is not a greater honor for a ham like me than to watch so many people get their licenses, learn the code, program a radio for the first time, win some wallpaper, or just enjoy each other's company over a cup of coffee. I get to constantly witness this as section manager. ARRL afforded me the opportunity to have experiences and gain memories that will last me forever. An ARRL life member, Patterson, will serve the balance of Siemens' term, which extends to the end of 2021. His amateur radio background is strong in mentoring, emergency communications, public service, and club leadership. He is a volunteer examiner and the treasurer of the Northern Amateur Relay Council of California, the repeater coordination body for that area that covers about two-thirds of California. Patterson is also on the board of the Pacific Division Annual Convention, Pacificon, active in the local CERT communications group, including trustee of the group's repeater, past president of the Mount Diablo Amateur Radio Club, and a member of several clubs within and outside the section. Patterson has been very active in the club's education and training programs and has helped many people to prepare for their first license and to upgrade. ARRL Radio Sport and Field Services Manager Bart Drenke, W9JJ, made the appointment based on the recommendations of Siemens and ARRL Pacific Division Director Kristen McIntyre, K6WX. The IARU member societies have voted to admit the Bahrain Amateur Radio Society and the Amateur Radio Union of the Kyrgyzstan Republic to membership. The IARU congratulates both organisations and welcomes them and their entire membership. The Bahrain Amateur Radio Society was founded on the 23rd of July 2020 and is legally registered and recognised to represent the amateurs of Bahrain. As of September, there were 15 members out of a total of 88 licensed radio amateurs in the country. The Kyrgyzstan Amateur Radio Union was founded on the 25th of October 2013 and is recognised to represent the amateurs of that country. As of October 2019, all 110 licensed amateurs in the country were members of the Amateur Radio Union. You can find out more by going to www.iaru-r1.org. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. Let's see, what happened this week? 
So I got a, I got a, I got a snail mail. Talking about another outmoded thing, not just websites, snail mail now. From uh, boy, it looked pretty urgent. Official mail from uh, domain listings, and uh, maybe you've gotten this. And I just wanted to reassure you, it's addressed to TechGuyLabs.com. Return by June twenty sixth, two hundred twenty eight dollars. Please remit payment to address by June twenty sixth. Annual website domain listing. I guess I have to do this every year. Yeah. Now you might look at this and go, "Wow, I guess this is my renewal." for my website it is not it is not this is not you know and they put it here in the but you, you might miss it it's a little bit less dark than the you must pay now and they even kind of very they put an envelope in and a little detachable payment coupon so it makes it very it looks like a bill doesn't it credit card number all that looks like a bill but this is not a bill this is a solicitation you are under no obligation to pay the amount stated above unless you accept this offer it really is just a You'd have to read this, but I could see why. I mean, they they make it look like you owe them. Doesn't that look like a bill? Like if I don't pay that, maybe nobody will be able to go to my website anymore. I think they probably got stung by people saying, you're a scam. So they put this little in thing. You're not obligated to do this. You're not. This is not your domain listing. This is, uh, I'll tell you what this is. Junk mail. So don't, I, I only, I, I only mention this because I'm sure if you have a website, you're going to get this. Because, you know, one of the things about websites is the address for the website is a public record. That's the way the domain registration system works. A lot of domain registrars, you know, if you go to Hover.com or GoDaddy, GoDaddy will charge you for it. Hover gives it to you for free, but they'll offer something called Who is Privacy? I understand that if, if you weren't raised in this, surrounded by it all the time, it would be very confusing. Like, what does that mean, Who is Privacy? Who is, pri what are you asking me? <laughs> what it really is, is there's a directory of all the domain names and the addresses and phone numbers associated with that. And you can look it up with a, with a system called who is, like who is techguylabs.com. Oh, who is privacy means that they obscure that information. In effect, they put in the, the public record a different company name address and phone number that then forwards it on to you so that nobody will then have from you you know from your record your personal address i use the business address because you know i don't that's a public address i don't mind if anybody knows that in the business phone number that's why you might want to use that because if you're using your home address and your cell phone number business number you may not want to have that publicly record and that's who these guys you know they just go and they they scrape all the addresses and they send them all this. And I figured they probably get, you know, most people go, well, I don't know. What is that? Throw it away. But I bet you one or two percent pay two hundred twenty eight dollars to be in a directory. Nobody, nobody looks at. What do you think the most important directory for finding websites is? Scratch my head. What could it be? What could it be? It's called Google. You don't pay anything to be on Google, but you would be paying two hundred and. $28 to be, I tore it up so I don't know their address anymore. <laughs> Domainlistings.com or something. Why would I pay 220 bucks to be on a directory nobody ever heard of and certainly nobody uses? By the way, I went there and there's lots of like, lots of people on there. Yeah, domainlistings.directory. Oh yeah, that's the first place I go when I want to find out, you know, who you, what your website is. But I, I saw a lot of companies there which means they paid law firms and stuff that paid 228 bucks to be in a directory nobody looks at. Nice. <laughs> what does Google charge to be uh, to be in the, their directory? Nothing. Okay, just it was just a little tip. Just a little, you know, something to remind you when you get this cuz you, you know, most of us if you have a website you're going to get it. You can ignore it. That's not real. In fact, if you Google domain listings if you start typing into Google domain listings, the first thing that it says domain listings scam. <laughs> it's not a scam because they say very clearly on there, uh, just, you don't need to do this. But nobody reads that. Obviously, otherwise there wouldn't be so many people listed there. Or maybe, maybe they just uh, put people there just to look like somebody paid them money. I don't know. That's possible too. My, when I was a kid, my dad, as a professor, you know, a 
in the in the field of uh, paleontology, well known, I guess, wrote some books. Every year we get this who's who. You've heard of who's who. This solicitation from who's who. You have been selected because of your eminence to be in who's who. Oh, wow, I always wanted to be in who's who. Uh, if you read the fine print, it costs, yeah, something like $228 to be listed in who's who. And I guess anybody who wants to pay for who's who can be in who's who. I can't remember if my dad did it or not. I think, you know, it reminds me a little bit of that wonderful movie, A Christmas Story. When uh, the guy gets a major award, right, in the big wooden crate, it's a woman's leg lamp. But he's so excited because it's a major award. This is how they get you. There was an actual who's who some time ago. It started in 1849. But I don't think this is the same who's who that sends out the thing. I guess they forgot to trademark who's who. So I don't think it's the same one that sends out the thing saying, you want to be in our who's who? So don't fall for either one of those. It's one of the things that's really true about the internet is there's nothing new. All the scams on the internet existed before the internet, except maybe Bitcoin. That didn't exist. Dogecoin didn't exist. But all the other ones existed and have just been moved to the new medium. So a uh, big scary article by uh, Dan Gooden, who's really very good, a security guy in Ars Technica this week, warning us in the most scary terms, Amazon devices will soon automatically share your internet with neighbors. Amazon's experiment, wireless mesh networking turns users into guinea pigs. Shame on you, Dan. That is nasty. That's link bait in the worst kind. Yes, it's true that starting uh, June 8th, Amazon will enable something called Amazon Sidewalk. And it's built into your uh, late model Amazon devices like your Echoes, your Fire TVs, your Ring security doorbells or cameras, your outdoor lights, your motion sensors, your tile trackers. All of it will be part of this system. But share your Internet is kind of sounds like, well, they could people can use it to get on the Internet. They can't. Mm -mm, too slow. It's uh, not designed for that at all. Plus, it, it's uh, completely anonymized completely anonymized so that it, it isn't your internet you're contributing which i think is a great thing a positive thing to a wireless mesh network that's designed for things like location tracking not your location but people with tile trackers there's a mailbox sensor you could put on there it basically adds iot connectivity to the world and in amazon has spent a lot of energy and a lot of time and a lot of very good engineering to make it private and secure i think it's going to be a, it could be a huge boon but stories like this dan gooden shame on you stories and i bet he didn't even write the headline stories like this uh scare people and they go well, i gotta turn that off our security guy, Steve Gibson, he does our podcast Security Now on the Twit Network, uh, looked at the white paper, went through it, said, this is properly designed. It's it's good. In fact, the only thing Dan says is, well, you know how things go wrong. It could be bad. <laughs> There's no evidence of that. He says, well, you know, Bluetooth's had problems. Yeah, okay. W uh, Wi-Fi's had problems. Yeah, okay. This is something else. It's called LoRa or Long Range Networking. He talks about at the end how to turn it off. And, and I'll tell you as well, if you want to, you, you have to go into the uh, A-L-E-X-A. I don't want to say it out loud. I don't want to wake up anybody's Echo device. You have to go into the app on your phone. Go to more, select settings, select account settings, select Amazon Sidewalk, turn it off. So it's buried, very deep. He says, no doubt the benefits of Sidewalk for some people will outweigh the risks but for the many, if not the vast majority of users, there's little upside and plenty of downside. Yeah, no, that's wrong. I think that's wrong, Dan. And I think that's a scare tactic. So I want to I want to be on record saying it's well designed. It's designed. To, yeah, I know it comes from Amazon. So people say, oh, it's going to be snooping on us. But they knew that that would be an issue. So they took great pains to design something that was private. It is not sharing your Internet, not in any significant way. It is, it is really uh, doing a favor to you and your neighbors. You could put one of these tags on your dog, and as your dog wanders through the neighborhood, it will be seen by the sidewalk network. 
the mesh network. It's not fast enough for cameras or even Wi-Fi or Internet access. It's not. It's slow. It uses the maximum bandwidth is 80 kilobits. Folks, that's like your, your modem, your dial-up modem. <laughs> and it won't be most of the time that. 80 kilobits is nothing. Total monthly data used by Sidewalk is capped at 500 megabytes. That's about 10 minutes of high-definition video. If you want to turn it off, I can understand. But I would, I would encourage people not to, uh, not to be scared. There are some real benefits to having this network. And because so many people have Echo devices, I think in any, you know, these things go half a mile. So in any populated area, as long as there's somebody with an Echo every, every say, quarter of a mile, you're going to have a nice network that I think will be very powerful and usable. So I wouldn't be afraid. <laughs> I wouldn't be afraid. We have to, you know, there there are benefits to technology. Every, the real, the real, um, you know, there's good things and bad things to technology, just as there is in many powerful things. You know, there's good and bad. Cars get in wrecks, but they also get us from place to place. Technology has positive and negative. Lately, we've been really focusing on the negative, forgetting how positive it's been. Imagine what COVID and the pandemic would have been like without technology to keep us connected. Your kids wouldn't have been able to go to school at all. A lot of us wouldn't have had a job because without the internet, we wouldn't have been able to work. So let's not uh, let's not go crazy here. It's good to acknowledge the potential problems, and when there are security flaws, yes, acknowledge them and fix them. But uh, just to say, oh, I'm not going to do it. It's, too, it's the risk. There's no risk. When some, I tell you what, the minute somebody comes up with a risk, I'll let you know. You can turn it off. How about that? And we know, by the way, you know, that Amazon is clearly wants you to leave it on. It's on by default and it will turn on all your, and I have Echo devices all around me. All of those will turn on on June 8th. I guess that scares people. And they definitely, as, as you heard when I've described it, buried the settings. We know that that's something companies do. In fact, a lawsuit against Google by the Arizona Attorney General has revealed documents that showed that Google itself knows how hard it is to find those privacy settings and they buried them when google this is from the business insider who read the documents when google tested versions of its android operating system that made privacy settings easier to find users took advantage of them which google viewed as a quote problem according to the documents to solve that problem google then sought to bury these settings deeper within the settings menu that's the trick they all use you make them deep enough it's with sometimes we call it the tyranny of the default, whatever the default is, that's what 90% of people are just going to go with it. And, you know, in most cases, that's fine, I think. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Italy's first female astronaut, Samantha Cristoforetti, IZ0UDF, has also become the first European woman chosen to command the International Space Station. The European Space Agency announced the former fighter pilot's selection on Friday, May 28th. She is to launch in 2022 with NASA astronauts Jell Lindgren, K05MOS, and Bob Hines aboard the SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. This will be her second stay on board the ISS, where she became the fifth European Space Agency astronaut to serve as its commander. In India, where crematoriums and graveyards are pushed beyond capacity to keep pace with the surges in death from COVID-19, amateur radio operators have stepped up to help provide some coordination amidst the chaos. The Indian Institute of Hams has created a communications network connecting 16 crematoriums, according to a news report in the Bangalore Mirror. More than 30 hams have been working around the clock to ensure proper and dignified handling of cremations as a reassurance to families, the report said. The Institute's director, S. Sathayapal, VU2FI, said, hams who are particularly experienced in crisis management have been visiting crematoriums at random, gathering details about any problems that have arisen. 
He also told the Bangalore Mirror that any disturbances reported at the crematoriums will be brought to the notice of officials and will alert the task force to inspect them immediately. Our aim is to see that a dignified farewell is given to the deceased without any hassles. The HAMS effort are a part of greater nationwide network of volunteer response from individuals and non-governmental organizations attempting to help funeral professionals at crematoriums and burial grounds. A report in the New York Times said that an average of 217,638 COVID-19 cases per day were reported in India in the last week although some reports indicate the number of cases and deaths has begun to decline in recent days. HAM SCI is the Amateur Radio Science Citizen Investigation. It's an initiative to connect amateur radio operators with scientific researchers and to use amateur radio as a citizen science tool to collect scientific data, particularly in geospace science. HAM SCI is currently looking for HAM radio operators to make recordings of time standard stations during the June 2021 annular solar eclipse across the Arctic Circle as part of a citizen science experiment. Researchers will use the crowdsourced data to investigate the superimposed effects of auroral particle precipitation and the eclipse on HF Doppler shift. Participants would collect data using an HF radio connected to a computer running open source software. Radio amateurs and shortwave listeners around the globe are invited to take part, even if their station is far from the path of totality. Last year's Eclipse festivals included more than 100 participants from 45 countries. The experiment will run from June the 7th to the 12th, and all participants will receive QSL certificates and updates as the data is processed. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. The early 1950s were not a time of peace and security in the United States. The Korean War was in full force with the constant threat of communist Chinese intervention. The Iron Curtain cut Eastern Europe off from the rest of the free world. The Soviet Union developed their own atomic weapons. Communists, real and imagined, roamed the United States with Senator Joseph McCarthy in hot pursuit. Writers, actors, and directors suffered under the Hollywood blacklist. In other words, the fabulous 50s were still a couple of years away. Amateurs were on the air, but many feared that the FCC would eventually suspend operations as they had during World War II. Amazingly, despite what QST called a national emergency, there was no civil defense program in place to utilize amateur radio operators in the case of enemy attack or natural disasters. The previous civil defense program, the War Emergency Radio Service, WERS for short, had been out of service since 1949. Even in its heyday, WERS had many shortcomings. It wasn't established until June 1942, seven months after the war started. It was limited to the two and a half and one and a quarter meter amateur bands with no HF frequencies. Finally, WES operations, other than on the air drills, were limited to actual enemy activity. There was no provision for WERS to be used during natural disasters. The AWRL, FCC, and the civil defense leaders learned from the mistakes of WERS and were determined to have a viable radio civil defense program in place when it was needed. Thus, on December 19, 1951, at the same time that Conrad was announced, the FCC released the proposed regulations for RACES, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. On August 15, 1952, the final RACES regulations were put into effect. Amateur radio operators now had a civil defense program in place that would utilize their communication skills. Before a RACES unit could be authorized, there were some requirements that had to be met. First, the local government needed a civil defense organization and a communications plan. The local plan had to be approved at the state civil defense level. Next was the appointment of the RACES radio officer. The radio officer, or RO for short, 
had to hold a conditional, general, advanced, or extra class amateur license, or a first or second class commercial radio telegraph or radio telephone license. The potential radio officer submitted FCC form 482 to receive the certification, provided, of course, that they passed the loyalty investigation. Note that the radio officer did not need to be an amateur. The FCC and civil defense experts determined that about 25,000 amateurs might be available for RACI's authorization. However, in a full-scale national emergency, up to 200,000 radio operators would be needed. Thus, provisions were incorporated for qualified commercial class licensees to become a part of the RACI's program. After the communications plan was approved and the radio officer was certified, station authorizations could be issued. Amateurs submitted FCC Form 481 to have their station license made valid for RACI's operation. Novices and technicians were not eligible for RACI's authorizations. The FCC and the ARRL emphasized that membership in RACI's was not an invitation to continue casual amateur radio activity in a war. RACI's was strictly dedicated to public service under the direction and control of the local CD unit. The frequencies initially allocated to RACI's were 1,800 to 2,000 kilocycles, subject to Loran restrictions, 3,500 to 3,510 kilocycles, 3,990 to 4,000 kilocycles, 28.55 to 28.75 megacycles, 29.45 to 29.65 megacycles, 50.35 to 50.75 megacycles, 53.35 to 53.75 megacycles, 145.17 to 145.71 megacycles, 146.79 to 147.33 megacycles, and 220 to 225 megacycles. In addition, 1750 to 1800 kilocycles, which was outside of our 160 meter band, was allowed under disaster communications services. Note that the initial frequencies did not include the 40, 20, and 15 meter bands. The 15 meter band was not yet available to amateurs when RACES was first proposed. Later, 40, 20, and 15 were added, and the 75 meter phone segment was expanded. Reaction to the RACES frequencies was mixed. Some were upset that they were insufficient and were not exclusive to RACES. Others thought of it as a diabolical plot on the part of government agencies and commercial interests to grab parts of the amateur bands for non-amateur use by non-amateur personnel. RACES was never used during an enemy attack. Over the years, however, it proved its value in countless natural disasters. Frequencies were expanded and novices and technicians were brought into the field. One interesting fact about RACES, it was designed to be a temporary service. The initial regulations indicated that it would be discontinued after the termination of the national emergency. Conrad has been gone for over 45 years, and the fallout shelter signs are rusting away on the walls of abandoned buildings. Why does RACES, a temporary service, still live? The answer is found in every natural disaster that hits the U.S. Every tornado, hurricane, flood, earthquake, blizzard, and fire. Every time dedicated amateurs, working with their local civil defense officials, provide effective emergency communications, they keep a temporary service alive. Time now for the AMSAT report. During the past month, some great satellite distance records have been set between Nova Scotia and France. John, VE1CWJ, and Jerome, F4DXV, claimed the initial distance record on JO97 of 4,889 kilometers between FN85 and JNO4. Dana, VE1IS, also in FN85, set the new record on XW2C with F4DXV again of 4,897 kilometers VE1CWJ and F4DXV also completed a distance record on LILAC SAT 2 of 4,888 kilometers. 
just getting into working the satellites and working the FM birds. Well, you know how busy those are on weekends. If you can pick up a 2 meter 70 centimeter all mode radio, you can get on the linear satellites. These are really a lot more fun and you can actually have a QSO on SSB or CW. Some examples of older rigs, the Yaesu 736R, the ICOM 810 or 910 or the Kenwood TS2000. With a little practice in correcting for Doppler, you'll be on the air in no time. The MSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. Space in Africa reports that a first amateur radio satellite project for the island of Mauritius called Mirsat-1 is scheduled to be launched on Thursday the 3rd of June on board a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket sending supplies to the International Space Station. MIRSAT-1 stands for Mauritius Imagery and Radio Satellite No. 1. It was designed by a team of Mauritian engineers and an experienced radio amateur from the Mauritius Amateur Radio Society in collaboration with experts from AAC Clyde Space UK. Mauritius was the winner of the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency's Kibo Cube program in 2018, and the agency awarded Mauritius the opportunity to build and deploy a 1U Cube satellite via the International Space Station. In February, Mirsat 1 was handed over to Japan so that it could be deployed from the Japanese experimental module on the International Space Station. The primary objective of MIRSAT-1 is to acquire satellite knowledge through the design process, design review, assembly, integration and testing of the device. The Mauritius Research and Innovation Council has set up a ground station located at its premises in Ibin, which will serve to control and operate MIRSAT-1. This ground station will also allow the reception of data and telemetry from other satellites. The ground station is being equipped with a flatsat module, a replica of the satellite, enabling engineers to simulate all the required maneuvers before sending the commands to the CubeSat. The flatsat module is a key tool which will allow the Mauritian engineers to design future CubeSats. This will be the second time that an African country has launched a satellite in 2021, after Tunisia placed its first satellite, Challenge 1, in orbit in March. MIRSAT will travel on the joint NASA SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, carrying the Dragon cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station. It will lift off from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida at 1729 UTC on the 3rd of June. And the launch will be streamed live. Just go to africanews.space. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that Solar Cycle 25 activity continues this week with no spotless days since May 6th. The average daily sunspot number rose modestly this week from 24.9 to 28, while the average daily solar flux held steady at 77.8. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux over the next few days is 75 on June 5th and 6th, 72 on June 6th through the 10th, 76 on June 11th, 78 on June 12th through the 15th, 80 on June 16th through the 18th, and 78 on June 19th through the 22nd. Taking a look now at the predicted planetary A index, it will be 8 on June 5th, it'll be 5 on June 6th through the 15th, 20 and 10 on June 16th and 17th, 5 on June 18th through the 27th, and 8, 5, 8, and 8 again on June 28th through July 1st. The Group for Earth's Observations aim is to enable amateur reception of weather and Earth imaging satellites that are in orbit or planned for launch in the near future. Membership of the GEO is free and the organization produces a quarterly newsletter. The June PDF of the GEO newsletter Weather Satellite Publication is now available for free download. And this edition includes the Suez Canal traffic jam as seen from space, the eruption at Mount Etna, preparing for rising seas in the Maldives, and lists of currently active weather satellites and frequencies. You can download the GEO newsletter from leshamilton.co.uk. And the group is both contactable by Groups I.O. and their Facebook page. Group for Earth Observation. Starting on June 29th, all applications filed with the Federal Communications Commission must include an email address for FCC correspondence. After receipt of the initial announcement that all future applications would require an email, 
ARRL was concerned for the privacy of its members and requested that amateur's email addresses not be made public. This week, the FCC agreed, stating in an email to ARRL counsel, that it will continue to mask amateur's email addresses from the public view in their universal licensing system. The FCC will use email address supplied by amateurs to correspond with applicants, including to send a link to the official electronic copy of the license when an application is granted. The FCC is transitioning to fully electronic correspondence and no longer mails hard copy licenses. Amateurs are able to view, download, and print their official license grant using the universal licensing system. When a license was first granted, each applicant would receive an email with a direct link to the license. Although the link expires in 30 days, the license itself will remain available in the ULS and may be downloaded at any time by signing into the licensee's account using their FCC registration number called an FRN and password. On or after June 29th, a valid email address must be provided with each application and must be kept current by filing a modification application as necessary. Under the amended section 97.23, the email address must be an address where the grantee can receive electronic correspondence. Revocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license may result when correspondence is returned as undeliverable because the grantee failed to provide the correct email address. Applicants lacking an email address should consider using the email address of a friend or family member on their FCC application. Reminder, due to changes the FCC has made to its licensing system starting on May 20th, all amateur exam applicants must provide their FRN to their volunteer examiners before taking an amateur exam. Prospective new FCC licensees will be required to obtain an FRN before the exam and provide that number to the VEs on Form 605. An FCC instructional video provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to obtain an FRN through the FCC's Commission Registration System, better known by the acronym CORES or CORES. The FRN is used afterwards by the applicant to download the official license document from the FCC's universal system to upgrade a license, to apply for a vanity call sign, and to submit administrative updates such as address and email changes and renewal applications. The Netherlands International Amateur Radio Union Member Society, Veron, says an additional charge of 79 euros, about 96 U.S. dollars a year, being levied on amateur radio repeaters and beacons is detrimental to experimental radio research. Regulator Agenshop Telecom said the higher rate is tied to additional costs specifically for investigation and surveillance for illegal users at relay stations. Veron has requested cancellation of the new fee. Elsewhere, a new 8-meter propagation beacon Call sign EI1CAH is now on the air from the west of Ireland on 40.016 MHz. The new beacon will transmit in both CW and PI4 mode with an output power of 25 watts into a horizontal dipole. According to the announcement, the new 40 MHz beacon is designed to explore the possibility of VHF paths across the Atlantic and it may prove a useful propagation for 50 MHz operators in North America looking for openings to Europe. The beacon has the potential to be heard in the Americas and the Caribbean. Visit EI7GL's blog for more information. Foundations of Amateur Radio One of the questions you're faced with when you start your amateur journey is around connectors. You quickly discover that every piece of equipment with an RF socket has a different one fit for purpose for that particular device. That purpose includes the frequency range of the device, but also things like water ingress, number of mating cycles, power levels, size, cost and more. As an aside, the number of mating cycles, how often you connect and disconnect something, is determined by several factors, including the type of connection, manufacturing precision and the thickness of the plating. That said, even a so-called low-cycle count connector, like say an SMA connector lasting 500 cycles, will work just fine for the next 40 years if you only connect it once a month. Back to variety. My Pluto SDR has SMA connectors on it, as do my bandpass filters, my handheld and one RTL SDR dongle. The other dongle uses MCX. 
Both my antenna analyzer and UHF antenna have an N-type connector, which is the case for my Yaesu radio that also has an extra SO239, which is what my coax switches have. My HF antenna comes into the shack as an F-type, and nothing I currently own has B and C, but stuff I've previously played with does. When you go out on a field day, you mix and match your gear with that of your friends, introducing more connectors and combinations. Invariably, you acquire a collection of adapters. At first, this might be only a couple, quickly growing to a handful, but after a while you're likely to have dozens or more. My collection, a decade's worth, which currently includes more than 25 different combinations, is over a hundred individual adapters and growing. For most of the time, these have been tossed into a little toolbox with a transparent lid. But more and more, as the collection and variety grew, I started to realize that I was unable to quickly locate an adapter that I was sure I had, since it had been used in a different situation previously. In addition to coming to the realization that the reason I couldn't find a connector was because it was still in use, I began to notice that I had daisy chains of connectors. For example, my HF antenna has a PL259 connector, that is adapted to an F-type connector with an SO239 barrel, a PL259 to BNC, and a BNC to F-type adapter. At the other end of the RG6 coax that runs from outside into the shack, the reverse happens, F-type to BNC and BNC to PL259. If you're counting along, that's five adapters to get from PL259 to PL259 via F-type. At this point, you might wonder why I'm using RG6 coax. The short answer is that I have several rolls of it left over from my days as an installer for broadband satellite internet. RG6 is very low loss, robust and heavily shielded. Although it's 75 ohm, a whole other discussion, in practice that's not an issue. What is a problem is that the only connectors available for it are F-type compression connectors. To get those to PL259 requires a step sideways via BNC. My point is that the number of adapters is increasing by the day. I should acknowledge the existence of so-called universal connector kits. The idea being that you go from one connector to a universal joiner and from that to another connector. Generally, these kits have around 30 connections, giving you plenty of options. But in reality, more often than not, you only have half a dozen universal joiners. So your money is effectively buying you half a dozen conversions. Great for a field day, not so great for a permanent installation. You could build your own collection and use something like SMA or BNC as your universal joiner, which is something I'm exploring. To keep track of my collection, recently I started a spreadsheet. It's essentially a list showing the number and types of connections. If you make a pivot table from that, you end up with a grid showing totals of adapters you have. You can use this grid to fill a set of fishing tackle boxes and all of a sudden you've got a system where everything has its own place. If you start this process, you'll quickly notice that the table only needs to be half filled since a BNC to SMA is the same as an SMA to BNC adapter. This leaves you space to do some fancy footwork where the bottom right hand of the triangle can fit into the top left hand of the empty space, but I'll leave you to figure that out. My table also includes things like TNC and MCX adapters, but I don't use those very often, so at the moment I'm putting them in their own box together with T adapters, and other weird and wonderful things like FME and reverse SMA. For setting the order, I've gone for alphabetic, but if you have a better suggestion, I'm all ears. My email address, as always, is cq at vk6flab.com. What ideas have you come up with to organize the chaos that is your sprawling connector library? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Most ham radio clubs have some sort of fundraising event each year. With a little extra effort, you can greatly improve the attendance at your club's next ham fest or other fundraiser. Most radio and TV stations offer free airtime to not-for-profit organizations to promote special events. There are often strict guidelines on submissions to media outlets, but even if you don't know what they are, you can often meet the requirements by submitting your information months ahead of time and wording your announcement correctly. 
remember, most media outlets will not call you to get clarifications or proof of not profit status. It's easier for them to pitch them in the trash than call and confirm the information that you should have included anyway. If you want the free airtime, the burden is on you to have those announcements ready for air when your announcement hits the mail. In this series, we'll create and submit a public service announcement for your local TV and radio stations. Be sure to get your club PR person to pay close attention to this series on This Week in Amateur Radio. First off, we need to put on paper a description of the event we wish to promote, answering all the pertinent questions of who, what, why, where, and when. Be sure to get complete answers to all these questions, assuming the information is being provided to people who know none of the above. Make no assumptions about what your audience may or may not already know. So provide all the information and double check it for accuracy. If your public service announcement or PSA says it's a half mile past Highway 101 to enter the fairgrounds, drive it yourself to be sure that is correct. Leave nothing to chance. Next time, we'll cover the outline for the PSA and putting ink on paper. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Federal Communications Commission is considering rule changes that would pave the way for approval of new low-power FM licenses. Acting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel said the matter is on the agenda at the Commission's June 17th meeting. The move follows actions the Commission took last year to modify engineering rules for low-power FM stations. The Irish Radio Transmitters Society CW Field Day takes place this weekend on the 5th and 6th of June. This contest is for portable stations and takes place in the Morse preferred segments of the contest bands from 160 meters top band up to 10 meters. It runs for 24 hours from 15 hours UTC on Saturday the 5th of June and there is both a 24 hour section and a restricted 6 hour section. The first weekend in June is when a number of IARU Region 1 societies would normally run CW Field Day contests and has always been a good opportunity for European CW operators to test their skills in a portable environment. The COVID pandemic has affected Field Day and other contests over the past year and no IRTS Field Day events were held in 2020. Following improvements in the public health situation in recent months, the IRTS decided to proceed with their field day events this year, subject to restrictions and precautions that have been inserted into the contest rules. It is noted that DARC, the German National Society, has decided to cancel its CW field day this year. While it acknowledges the improved health situation, it's concerned that regulations or restrictions may not be uniform throughout the country. The RSGB CW Field Day contest is going ahead, so we can expect plenty of activity from UK portable stations. WSJTX version 2.4.0 is now generally available for use. According to co-developer Joe Taylor, K1JT, WSJTX version 2.4.0 includes the new digital mode Q65. Q65 is designed for two-way contacts over especially difficult propagation paths, including ionospheric scatter, troposcatter, rain scatter, TEP, EME, and other types of fast fading signal. Q65 will enable stations with a modest Yagi and 100 watts or more to work one another on six meters at distances up to about 2,000 kilometers on most days of the year in dead band conditions. For the complete announcement, see the WSJTX website. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. Remember that the Learning Network webinars are a members-only benefit. To register, check on upcoming webinars, and to view previously recorded sessions, visit the ARRL Learning Network webinar webpage. Ask the Lab how ARRL's Technical Information Service can help you. Hosted by ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare, W1RFI will be presented on Tuesday, June 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 1700 UTC. Learn about the ARRL Technical Information Service and the expert ARRL laboratory staff who answer thousands of questions each year from members. Get tips about projects, suggestions to address various station installations, and help for some of your more pressing ham radio questions. 
You'll discover how to search ARRL's extensive periodicals archive, find helpful articles, read test reports, access technical forms, and find answers to technical questions beyond the lab. Improving Your Club's 2021 Field Day Score, hosted by Paul Bork, N1SFE, ARRL Contest Program Manager, will be held on Thursday, June 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern, that's 0 UTC on Friday, June 11th. Learn how your club or group can take advantage of the 2021 ARRL Field Day Rules Waivers while operating as Class D or E from home. We'll discuss how individuals or groups can boost their scores by earning bonus points, review how to use the Field Day web applet to submit your score, and go over how to attribute your score to your club's aggregate score. This presentation highlights all you need to know to operate as a group for ARRL Field Day 2021. Antenna Zoning Part 1 Permitting in a Nutshell Hosted by Fred Hoppengarten, K1VR is scheduled for Monday, June 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern, that's 1800 UTC. This is the first webinar of a special six-part series being presented by Fred Hoppengarten, K1VR, author of Antenna Zoning for the Radio Amateur. Don't let the confusing tangle of ordinances and bylaws keep you from installing the antenna you need in order to communicate effectively. Introduction to Remote HF Operation hosted by David Lemberconi, W6DGE, and Kevin Schinwheeler, N7KSW, from the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club, will be presented on Tuesday, June 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Then Franconi and Shin Wheeler will discuss the idea, process, and challenges encountered while getting their club's remote HF station on the air, as well as some methods and resources available for those with a similar interest. A question and answer session and live demo are included. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL Learning Network schedule, as always, is subject to change, so please check the ARRL Learning Network webinar page for the latest details. NASA has selected LightCube, along with 13 other small research satellites, to fly as auxiliary payloads aboard rockets launching between 2022 and 2025. With more details on this unique satellite, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report on LightCube from League Headquarters in Newington. Being designed, built, and tested by an interdisciplinary team of students, advisors, and engineers across multiple organizations, LightCube is a microsatellite educational mission that aims to produce a light visible to the naked eye to observers on Earth. The spacecraft's two xenon flash tubes will be triggered via amateur radio. When the light beacon is activated, the one-unit CubeSat will be visible momentarily. Each flash will take eight microseconds, with a brightness similar to that of the International Space Station. Following deployment from the ISS, LightCube will orbit Earth for approximately two years. The LightCube mission is a collaborative project between Arizona State University and other entities ASU designed and built the satellite. Here's how it works. A radio amateur with a handheld transceiver will wait until the satellite is roughly overhead. The user then will transmit a predefined number code, and if LightCube is charged, it will flash. The satellite then requires 30 seconds to recharge the capacitor that fires the xenon light tubes. Details to come. The launch opportunity is provided through NASA's CubeSat Launch Initiative. At this point, no frequencies have been coordinated for LightCube. The idea itself is not novel. As the LightCube sponsors note, FitSat in 2013 used high-power LEDs to transmit Morse code. Equisat in 2016 could produce a beacon visible to the naked eye. The popular Irish Fest in La Crosse, Wisconsin, making a comeback this August. And this year, the festival will be bringing Ireland to Wisconsin in a new way. The Riverland Amateur Radio Club, W9UP, has invited a number of Irish amateur radio clubs to join in the activity on the Mississippi Riverfront. Irish Fest trustee Sean Hicks, KD9KGQ, a board member of the Riverland Club, 
said he has already received a positive response from the Shannon Basin Radio Club and the East Leinster Amateur Radio Club. He said that while Irish music, games, and storytelling will be part of the usual attractions, festival attendees will also get an opportunity to hear from hams in Ireland and experience amateur radio. In his invitation sent to various ham clubs based in Ireland, Sean wrote that our radio club members will be more than eager to make DX contacts in Ireland, but we'd like for our hams to partner with a fest attendee, give them an opportunity to chat with you. This would also give them a chance to learn a little bit about the region in Ireland where you live and a chance for you to learn a little bit about us as well. The club will be on the air at the festival on August 14th from 1600 to 2200 UTC on 14.260 MHz. We'll also conduct QSOs with their hams in Ireland via Yesu Fusion Wires X Room 63956. Sean said if clubs want to meet in a different wires X Room, that would be possible too. Meanwhile, a special event station is about to get underway in Hawaii. The 19th century Hawaiian King Kamehameha, who is celebrated for having united the islands of Hawaii in 1810, would no doubt appreciate the spirit of the day on Friday, June 11th. On that day, amateur radio operators will be working in unison as a special event station, K6K, honoring the leader, warrior, businessman, and diplomat whose vision for the islands kept Western explorers from encroaching on their territories. As envisioned by Michael Miller, KH6ML, the special event station will carry the King's story around the world as operators on the various islands make as many contacts as possible. This is not a contest and there will be no paper QSL cards. However, downloadable certificates will be available. For more details, visit the QRZ page of K6K. Hands of shortwave listeners around the world have been invited to the latest Solar Eclipse Festival being held by Hampside to gather data using their HF radios and a computer running open source software. Hampside is looking for ham radio operators to make recordings of time standard stations during the June 2021 annual solar eclipse across the Arctic Circle as part of a citizen science experiment. The annular phase of the eclipse will be visible from parts of northern Canada, Russia, and Greenland. A partial eclipse is likely to be visible, weather permitting, in Europe, Northern Asia, and the United States. Researchers will use crowdsourced data to investigate the superimposed effects of aurora particle precipitation and the eclipse of the HF Doppler shift. Participants would collect data using an HF radio connected to a computer running open source software. A precision frequency standard such as a GPS disciplined oscillator is desired but not required to participate. Radio amateurs and shortwave listeners around the globe are invited to take part, even stations far from the path of totality. Last year's Eclipse Festivals included more than 100 participants from 45 countries. The experiment will run from June 7th to June 12th. All participants will receive QSL certificates and updates as the data is processed. The primary beacon for the experiment will be on the Russian time standard station, Romeo Whiskey Mike, on 9.996 MHz. If your radio cannot receive this frequency, try 10 MHz WWV or another station listed in the HamSci website such as CHU. This is a pilot experiment for HamSci's personal space weather station project, which seeks to develop a global network monitoring of the geospace environment. For more information and setup instructions, visit the June 2021 Arctic Eclipse Festival page on the HamSci website. And finally this week, the Chamlicha TV and Radio Tower in Istanbul stands 369 meters tall, or 1,210 feet tall. A futuristic, state-of-the-art structure being heralded as the tallest telecommunications tower in Europe. At its inauguration in late May, Turkish President Erdogan praised the high-tech structure for its ability to carry 100 FM broadcasts simultaneously, noting that it replaces numerous outdated facilities that had previously stood on the same hill. The mass of older towers had long been criticized as marring the city's skyline and posing health risks for city residents. Construction began on the new tower in 2016 in the hopes it would also be a magnet for tourism in the city. The tower is located on the Asian side of the city, and its highest point is more than 580 meters, or 1,900 feet, above sea level. 
This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD Repeater System on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates, Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates, Incorporated. All rights reserved.